Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Arm of Mother Manzoli by Merle Constantner. Part 1, The Lovesick Professor. Nine out of every ten amateur murderers live upon themselves secretly as hotshot geniuses. It's the other lad, the tenth, that's really bad medicine. He doesn't think he's any smarter than his fellow man. He just works his way through the night school of homicide the hard way, plugging along, planning ahead, taking care of details. He's original, cagey, and can do a lot of killing before he's scotched. This was the sort of baby behind the university court slangs, as crafty and vicious a murder sequence as we ever tackled. We just finished lunch and were in the office bedroom. I stood at the window in my stocking feet, deftly balancing a saucer of peanuts and a glass of tepid ale. The dean was fiddling at his workbench beneath his green student's lamp. I recognized the signs and they worried me. He was sulking. There was no telling why. Maybe it was something that had happened at breakfast. Maybe it was some minor irritation he'd been subjected to last week and just got around to brooding over. I asked, What's your favorite song, Chief? He looked startled. Song? I can't say offhand. Why? You're griping about something you can't even remember. As long as you stay this way, we'll starve. I thought perhaps you'd like to join me in a little two-man community sing. Psychologists say it's elevating to the spirit. He parted his angry lips to loose a withering retort when there was a noise out front. We heard the door open and the sounds of footsteps in the reception room. I cut my eye at the chief, he said mulishly. Tell them to get out. No clients today, please, I said. What's the matter with me? I'll take over. I put on my house slippers and left the room. There was a brace of them, assorted, one male and one female, sitting side by side on the dean's antebellum love seat. The little brunette was just a kid, her late teens or early twenties and plenty attractive. She had sulky lavender eyes and long lashes and a boyish little figure. But there was an air of helpless feminine humility about her that rang about as true as a lead quarter. The lad with her was right out of the sporting ads, obviously wealthy and super obnoxious. He was middle-aged, powerfully built and dressed in as gaudy a swatch of houndstooth check yard goods as I've seen outside a tailor's window. He had a big red face with silky silver eyebrows and tiny porcelain cold eyeballs that lurked back in their fleshy caves, frosty and suspicious. I tried to mimic the dean. Well, who was here first? Raise your hands, please. He blinked, took a short gasping breath. He'd had a speech all ready to reel off and I'd mixed him up. He drew himself up, said crossly. I'm sure your insolent tone is accidental, sir. I am J. Bogardus Keen. He paused. I looked blank. He added petulantly, you know, Keen, the <clears throat> retired woolen goods magnet. This is Miss Marcia Cowan. We're not competing, as you rather crassly imply. We came in together and wish to consult you jointly. You're Wardlow Rock, I presume? Monkey food. I'm Ben Matthew. Mr. Rock is engaged. What do you want? They exchanged questioning glances. Decided that I was just riffraff. I was better than nothing, as Cowan straightened her short dress modestly said. I wish to retain you. Mr. Keene is sort of sponsoring me, so to speak. We'd like your help on two points. The first is the love potion. I understand Mr. Rock is a student of medieval alchemy. I want him to stew up some kind of an antidote. That's the main thing. Then there's Mr. Saxby, my fiancé, who's beginning to show signs of being mentally upset. We want you to find out what it is that's injuring his reason and remove it. Already, I was in over my head. I tried to get organized. Let's get this clear. Then J. Bogardus here. Isn't your betrothed? They both looked horrified. I asked, Who are you people? And who is this Saxby? And if he's your fiancé, 
why does he have to hop himself up with a love potion? Miss Cowan waved me down with a gesture of her limp hand. It's not that way at all. We all live out in the university court neighborhood. That's why we're all friends. Steve Saxby and Beanie here, the sporty man smirked, and myself, well, up on the corner is an old run-down house, lives Professor Eggleston. He has some kind of tenuous affiliation with the college, but he's getting rather ancient now and spends most of his time at home. He's quite a character. I listened patiently. No doubt. No doubt. The kid continued. University court isn't snooty. It's just that we all have kind hearts. Of late, Professor Eggleston has been walking the streets in a rather shabby condition. Miss Callum went on. It is just heartbreak to watch the poor old fellow. Regardless suggested the professor needed a feminine hand to guide him. I volunteered. Every morning, I drop in for an hour and fix him up, mend and darn and see that he has clean linen. I said gustily. I bet the old professor likes that. He didn't know how to refuse at first, so he tolerated me. The gal frowned. I sure wish those days were back. In the meantime, he's mixed up this love potion for himself. And now he just sits and drools while I sew. He keeps his drug in a bottle, says it's cough syrup. I brought it along without his knowledge. She produced a small parcel twisted in brown paper, laid it on the table. I want Mr. Rock to analyze it and prescribe an antidote. It's a pathetic thing to see a dignified old man in the throes of puppy love. J. Bogardus looked indescribably sad. Marcia's right. It fairly rings your, I know, I cut him off. What's this about Mr. Saxby? I'm worried about him, Miss Cowan smiled somberly. We're practically engaged in, he's beginning to do such erratic things. Last month, he decided to be a treasure hunter and went out and made maps of the neighborhood. He's given that up, thank goodness. The other day, he suddenly went in for prize fighting. I don't mean he fights. He's making a study of all the pioneer pugilists. He has pictures of these coarse persons all over his house. Something is making him do these strange things. We want to know what. You and Beanie, I grinned. You folks are certainly hounds for charity work. Okay, you've hired a detective. I ushered them to the door. At the threshold, the big man hesitated. He fumbled in his pocket, came out with a glossy pigskin wallet. Here, sir, is $50, your retainer fee. Mr. Keene closed the door behind them. Abruptly, he reopened it, called through the slot. You are now in my employ. Remember, no man can serve two masters. Tally-ho. Before I could retort, the door slammed. University court. I knew I had something hot. I ambled into the office bedroom with a banknote and the package. The dean was lolling in his broken-down Morris chair, his eyes closed. The black sniff of a Cuban cigar screwed into the corner of his mouth when I drifted in. I gave him a detailed review of my seance with our new clients. When I'd finished, he tried to belittle me, but his heart wasn't in it. What fold roll? Treasure hunters, prize fighters, and love potions? He reached forward. So this is Professor Eggleston's cough syrup? He unwrapped the stiff brown paper. It was an ordinary four ounce medicine bottle, empty. He glanced at the label and almost dropped the vial in his astonishment. Good Lord, Ben, take a look at this. I peered over his shoulder. The sticker was a messy job. Pasted over the regulation drugstore label, it had been typed on an old-fashioned typewriter and said, 1,000 parts strass, 8 parts oxide of copper, 0.2 parts oxide of chromium. What is it, I asked? Some slow-acting poison? Benton, my boy, this is big, and there's going to be big money in it for us. It hurts me to reprimand you, but I must take this occasion to inform you that I am the proper person to interview prospective clients that by exceeding your authority, we are indeed fortunate that you have not jeopardized. The same old merry-go-round, I swear. I wonder a dozen times a day how I ever managed to hang on. The dean likes to pose as an amiable crackpot, and as long as I've known him, sometimes even I can't figure him. I used to be a troubleshooter for a small safe company. He picked me up when I was down and out and gave me a job. I'm no big brain. All I know is guns and locks. I said bitterly, Clients come, you turn deaf. I take them on, and now you're graveling because... But University Court, Ben, that was the tip-off. You should have run screaming for me when you heard University. 
Actually, I didn't kid myself. I knew he was right. It was a strange mix-up. The case had broken about four months ago. The papers were full of it. Nobody could make heads or tails of it. An old lady named Taggart lived alone in a ramshackle mansion out in the university court section. One night, she had two lodgers and about ten the next morning. When they didn't answer her knock for breakfast, she entered their room and found them dead in bed, a man and his wife. They'd been shot at close range, and a rusty old Ivor Johnson lay on the coverlet. Miss Taggart told the law that she didn't have the slightest idea who they might be. Around six the night before, they'd come up on her porch and said they'd like a room for the night. They seemed the tourist accommodated sign in her parlor window, they said. They were fortyish and seedy looking, but shabby through neglect, she judged, rather than through poverty. The man was bald headed and his wife wore a pair of those nose glasses with a black ribbon. They looked somber, but respectable. She took them in and during the night, they killed each other. The tragedy must have occurred about 11 because that was the time she always took Ophelia, the cat, out for her walk. There were no shots after Miss Taggart returned. On that point, she was definite. The law had put it down as a suicide pact. There had been a mild flurry of mystery to it at first, the mystery of the third and iron. It seemed as though the couple had been extremely cautious about destroying all marks of identity. They'd cut out the window screen, laid it on the andirons in the fireplace like a grate, and had burned the woman's pocketbook, the man's wallet, and an assortment of private papers. That part was natural enough, but the andirons themselves presented a riddle. The two regular ones had cats on them, and in between the cats was a third, an andiron with an owl on it. Miss Taggart said she kept this set in a storeroom at the end of the hall. She had no further explanation. So it was a suicide pact, and the newspapers gave it a heartthrob banner. But the next day, it almost yelled into murder. Almost, but not quite. An anonymous telephone call informed the police that Miss Taggart wasn't in the habit of taking in tourists. The speaker, a man, said that he was a neighbor of the old lady's, that he'd passed the house many times and seen no sign in the parlor window. He suggested flatly that Miss Taggart had placed the placard in the window the morning of the deaths, that she'd found the bodies, grabbed a pen and ink, and dashed off a boarder's taken-in card after the murders. Miss Taggart, confronted with the new evidence, admitted exactly that. She said never before had she taken rumors. However, the man and his wife introduced themselves as friends of Professor Eggleston's in town for the night. The next morning, when she discovered the corpses, she phoned the professor. To her astonishment, he finally disclaimed any knowledge or relationship with her guest, whatever. It was then that Miss Taggart, panicky, drew up the fake sign. A month later, Miss Taggart, alone in her big house, died from an overdose of sleeping powders and gimmicked the whole affair tighter than a drum. The mysterious guests were never identified. And now the guy pops up again, I exclaimed. Eggleston, and this time he's lovesick. In my opinion, he's... Let's not rush to any shaky conclusions, Ben. Maybe we'd better have a brief chat with this scholarly gentleman. Out front the reception room, door open. The boss frowned. More visitors? And I think I recognize those stalwart hoofbeats. Part 2. Homemade Emeralds. This time, it was the law. Lieutenant Bill Malloy and Captain Kunkel. The captain was holding a cheap straw suitcase clamped beneath his arm. The dean bowed stiffly, said, Greetings, sires. He pointed a peremptory dindex finger at the suitcase under Kunkel's arm. May I inquire, captain, as to what you're mothering so tenderly? I seem to sense that this is somehow the object of your visit. Captain Kunkel took three short steps forward, placed his polished shoes at careful right angles. First, I wish to state that our call here is unofficial. You might even say social. The lieutenant and I were having a bit of an argument, and as we happened to be passing, we thought we'd drop in and get you to settle it. <clears throat> now, here's our puzzler. You know those wax figures of famous criminals that you see in many penny arcades and carnival concessions? Here's what we want to know. What do they look like underneath their clothes? The limbs, for instance. Are they crudely shaped? 
or are they carefully sculpted like the hands and faces? And the color, added Malloy, underneath the clothes, are those wax people all grayish and drab? The dean was getting nettled. What is this? Stop beating about the bush. Conkle laid his straw suitcase on the table beneath the lamp, opened the lid. We stared. The captain said hoarsely, Isn't it grisly? Isn't it horrendous? Inside on a nest of shredded newspapers was an arm. It looked exactly like a human arm, except it was a faded sort of gray. It was a large arm, bent slightly at the elbow and heavily muscled. I could hardly believe it was artificial. You even could see the texture of the skin and the fingernails looked almost alive. The upper end had been modeled in a gruesome way, as if the arm had been lopped off by a surgical instrument. You could make out veins and arteries and stuff. The dean was speechless with admiration. Finally he spoke. Gad, this is a pleasure I never expected. I can hardly believe it. It's a gem, isn't it? What a beauty! Captain Conkle looked nauseated. To me, it's highly revolting. What makes it so gray? Because it's so very old. No, this is no makeshift from a carnival concession. The chief closed the suitcase affectionately. Treat it with great care. It's very valuable. By the way, where did you get it? Malloy shifted his feet. He said gruffly, Thanks, Rock, for what I don't know. We'll be getting along, right, Captain? I'll make a deal, the dean said hastily. I admit, I've been holding back on you. You tell me how it came into your possession, and I'll tell you what you've got. That's one of the arms of Mother Manzoli. The Manzoli family were skilled craftsmen in wax figures. They lived in the middle of the 18th century in Bologna and specialized in anatomical models. Their works are museum pieces. How came you by this treasure? The officers paused on the threshold. Captain Kunkel showed beads of sweat across his brow. It's all so confusing. This suitcase with its contents was found on the doorsteps of the elite diner this morning when the proprietor opened up. The dean pursed his lips. The elite. I don't believe I... A greasy spoon lunch wagon out by the college in the university court neighborhood. I see, the dean answered vaguely. I see. Well, good afternoon, gentlemen. After they were gone, the chief said briskly, just as I suspected, the Taggart Eggleston affair is a long way from being closed in the official books. Well, let's be on the move. We've a mighty busy evening ahead of us. I'm tenderloin born and raised. I didn't go for it. I said, boss, this job's too spooky for me. A treasure hunter wacky over old time prize fighters, a wax arm and a college professor doping himself on love potions? Love potions? The dean looked bewildered. Oh, you mean the bottle? That wasn't a love potion. That romantic touch was a product of Miss Marcia Cowan's neurotic imagination, he chuckled. Strass and oxide of copper and oxide of chromium? That's not out of Materia Medica. Strass is a kind of clear glass. The prescription on the bottle is not a prescription at all but a formula the professor hoped to conceal from prying eyes. It's the traditional formula, tried and true for imitation emeralds. Yes, the venerable scholar, for some reason or other, intends to turn out a batch of homemade gems. To my surprise, I learned that the dean was perfectly at home in the university court neighborhood. It developed, too, that he had made a purely academic study of the district months ago at the time of the tragedies, and wasn't entirely unfamiliar with the name and addresses of our clients. He was one man you simply couldn't calculate. The court was a dreary little community a few blocks from the college campus, a bizarre mixture of the old and the new of ancient rotting mansions in their groves of gnarled and blighted oaks, interlaced with patches of tiny modern bungalows trim and spanking in new paint. The sodden afternoon sky was breaking into layered clouds lipped with dull silver and the desolate yards of pavement were illuminated by a watery sepulchral light. The dean slowed up, said, Well, here we are. My first look at Professor Eggleston's home clashed with my mental image of it. The gal had referred to it as an old house on the corner, and I'd conjured up a picture of a stark, ominous place with broken window panes and a front lawn overgrown with weeds. The neat story-and-a-half structure was set up on a terrace, close-clipped plot of grass. It was a white brick and almost clinical in its severity. A small one-room annex was built out at one side, like a garage, but there was no drive leading from it. 
The professor's workshop, the dean explained. See, there's a light showing. He's tinkering around at something. We ascended the tired steps, took a narrow cement walk around the side of the building, and knocked. Leisurely footsteps sounded from within. The door opened. I goggled at the little man in the doorway. It was difficult to believe that this was the fellow whose name had been jumping into the case so frequently and so unexpectedly at every crook and turn. He was a twisted dwarfish chap, turn it shaped with big shoulders and a chest that dwindled away to scrawny thighs and tiny midget feet. His baggy black suit was rusty with age. A small round baby head emerged from his tieless collar. He nodded and beamed and waggled his chin in an ecstasy of pleasure at seeing us. Visitors, he raps at eyes. Visitors, well, I do declare. Come in, gentlemen, come in. Old Eggleston gets so lonely. We walked into the workshop. Professor Eggleston, the dean said politely, I am Wardlow Rock, and this is Benton Matthews, my firebrand assistant. We're detectives. We've come for a bit of information. I understand that since you've retired from teaching, you accepted the responsibility of the curatorship of the college museum. Eggleston seemed pleased. That's right. So you've heard of me. I'm curator. We're building up quite a valuable accumulation. It's slow work, but we're building it up. The dean sympathized. Through bequests, right? That's right. Rich collectors die and leave us their collections. We took in our surroundings. The workshop was bare, with a bench along one wall, a rack of nondescript tools. On a table in the corner was a screw press with an iron wheel. The dean strolled over, said with interest, Binding a book, I observed. You're quite a talented craftsman, sir. Rebinding a book, Mr. Rock. Professor Eggleston looked annoyed. I'm bothered with death watches. The boss clucked his tongue, suddenly grinned at me. Don't look so impressed, Ben. Death watch sounds macabre, but it's simply the proper term for bookworm. When the beetles and their larvae get into a library, they can certainly devastate it. What is this book, sir? And may I ask how long you've had it? Eggleston was enjoying the sociability. It's a rare and valuable volume from my personal library. I've had it for many years. It's a medieval lapidary. A lapidary? The dean was silent. Tell me about it. A great emotion suddenly filled the little professor. He tried unsuccessfully to conceal his excitement. To you and your friend, jewels are baubles, ornate toys to embellish your garb. The ancients knew differently. Gems, gentlemen, are more than mere stones. They have power. Power for good and evil. The wise ones, the scientists of ancient times, understood the ruby and the diamond and the emerald. However, they erred in attributing this inner power of gems to latent demonical influence. The scientists of the future will understand the true nature of the energy of gems. Take the mineral radium, sirs. Can anyone deny its brutal force? He controlled himself. To answer your question, a lapidary is a treatise on jewels and their peculiar influences on the human body. The dean bowed courteously. A very enlightening discourse, Professor. Uh, you say you've had the volume for quite some time? Goodness gracious, yes, for 20 years at least. Everyone seems to ask the same question. Bogardus Keene and Miss Cowan were quite persistent on the point. Even Steve Saxby registered curiosity. Professor Eggleston's baby face broke into a rollicking cherubic smile. By the way, you said you were detectives. May I inquire why you honor me with your presence? It's about Anna Morandi Manzoli, the Italian wax sculptress of the 18th century. The dean chose his words carefully. I've been informed that the College Museum has an arm done by that imminent artiste. I thought perhaps as curator you might remember seeing this piece. Professor Eggleston rubbed his stumpy fingers. You're on the right road, but you've the cart before the horse. You're no doubt referring to the Simpson collection. Mr. Simpson, an extremely wealthy manufacturer and one of our most respected alumni, passed away not long ago and left us his private collection. It's rumored that Simpson, among his other treasures, possessed a manzoli arm. What do you mean, it's rumored? Haven't? No, we haven't received the stuff yet. It should be along any day now. The dean looked puzzled. Most private collections have a catalog. That's true, indeed they do. But Mr. Simpson considered catalogs barbaric and impersonal. He loved his art objects as though they were. The dean spoke casually. Generally, after death come the appraisers. I wonder how Mr. Simpson's collection 
avoided such an invoice. Eggleston said helpfully, It appears that Mr. Simpson was intending to erect a tiny museum on his estate. He had the stuff freighted up, ready to move. Nobody bothered to unpack it. They're shipping it along to the college in the original crates. We picked up our hats, prepared to leave. The dean paused in the doorway. I want to thank you for an edifying visit, sir. Believe me, I don't intend to run a subject into the ground, but the Simpson collection, did it contain any rare volumes such as, let's say, lapidaries? The dwarfish little man contorted his neck affably. I wouldn't know. Did it contain any priceless gems such as rare historical emeralds? Quite possibly, Professor glowed happily. We'll find out when the crates get here, won't we? Good day, gentlemen, good day. Outside on the sidewalk, I got my brain to working. We walked along a bit in silence. Finally, I said, This job's shaping up fast, isn't it? Like you always claim, if you get enough facts, a picture materializes all by itself. You know who I've been thinking about, Chief? Sam the Switchman. I bet you ten to one he's got a finger in this somewhere. What say we drop in on him? And just who is Samuel the Switchman? The dean laughed at a seriously no Benton. This is no time to be introducing new personalities. Let's not fly off at tangents. Saxby, Eggleston, Keene, and Cowan. Three married gentlemen and a lonesome maiden. Somewhere within this charming little group of cozy human lurks, the nefarious mode of which, he cut his eye at me, remarked queerly. Is it possible that you've reached some sort of conclusion so soon, that you've already solved the case? I looked innocent and said, to quote lovable old Professor Eggleston, I wouldn't know. I'll give you a hint, though. How are you making out on that imitation emeralds formula? Break that down, and you've got the motive. I've been trying to, the dean said, nettled. There's something devilishly elusive about it. I think I've got it, and then it evades me. Frankly, I fear we'll have to garner a bit more information before it makes sense. We turned from the pavement through a pair of low pink boulder gate posts, found ourselves in a broad landscape lawn, the domicile of Mr. Stephen Saxby. The dean announced gustily, We shall now see what we shall see. It was a big lumpish house of gray fieldstone and red Spanish tiles set in a scraggly clump of silver poplars. It looked like money. The dean took a dirty envelope and a pencil stub from his breast pocket, made a quick swashbuckling crisscross of lines. This is University Court, Ben. These are the residences of Keene and Miss Cowan. This is Saxby's. Here, while I make the X, is the late Miss Target's. On this corner back there is Eggleston's. Do you observe that our principals reside in a rough circle about the Taggart place? Let's always keep this diagram in mind. Before I could retort, he was off up the drive. I followed him into the impressive flagstone porch. He dropped the knocker on its exertion, said from the corner of his mouth, Hold on to your hat. Here we go again. Part 3 as Saxby's secret sorrow. The fellow that answered our knock was lanky, slight framed, with a gaunt hatchet face of an incurable busybody. He had a lock of tousled hair over his bony forehead, an oversized aristocratic chisel-bladed nose that flared into two hairy nostrils over a fussy, V-shaped mustache and a team of hungry little brown eyes that skipped ceaselessly over you here and there, never meeting yours, always checking and analyzing and estimating. I wouldn't have trusted him to run up to the drugstore and bring back the deposit on a pop bottle. He was wearing a showy, quilted dressing robe and had a stag and hound meerschaum drooping from his clenched jaw. He waited hostily for us to explain ourselves. The dean said pleasantly, It's a beautiful afternoon, isn't it, Mr. Saxby? May we step in a moment? We've come to certify you. Saxby's malevolent little brown eyes bugged out. Certify me? Who the hell are you anyway? You mean you think I'm balmy? Oh, the boss shook a reproving finger. We didn't say that yet. There have been reports, you know, and um, complaints. We're employed by Mr. J. Bogardus Keene. He asked us to sort of um, examine you. The procedure is perfectly painless. It's rather like a guessing game. May we? Saxby's rodent lip with dim fury. When he spoke, his voice was icy calm, he said. So, Keen's behind this. Just come inside, please. I'd like to do a little examining on my own. We entered a small antechamber. Inside, the house didn't seem so grand. 
It was jerry-built, flashy, but cheap. The rug on the floor was imitation oriental. To our left, a staircase ascended upward to the second floor. The massive new post with its ram's horn was imitation mahogany, and so was the banister. It was here in the hallway, alongside a cheap reproduction of an antique grandfather's clock, that we saw our first prize fighter. This was something different, a genuine collector's item. The dean strolled forward and examined it with interest. Matted in the center of a rather large gilded frame, it hung exhibition height, about on the level with your eyes. It was a picture of a barrel-chested boxer, an old-timer, with handlebar mustaches. He was dressed in tight pants, naked above the waist, and held his fist, raised stiffly in a boxer's garb. Fig! The dean exclaimed. The king of the bare knuckles. That's a nice print, sir. Gracious, I'd like to own it, Saxby said. This way, please. We turned right through an archway and followed our host into a great parlor. Same old tawdry imitation of wealth, huge imitation marble fireplace, more imitation oriental rugs. In this room, there were more prize fighter pictures, one on each of the four walls. We passed through the parlor, through an open door at the rear, and found ourselves in Mr. Saxby's cut-rate den. The cubbyhole was offensively swanky. Goat hides on the floor, a bookcase loaded with gaudy bindings, mail-order moose heads and Indian blankets. Suddenly, I realized that Saxby had run out of prize fighters. There were no boxing pictures in the den. Our hatchet-faced host gestured us shrewdly to chairs, sat down confronting us. So, you're hirelings of Beanie Keens, huh? So now he's trying to sock me in the nut foundry? First he steals my gal, and now he's trying to... The dean cleared his throat insinuatingly. We're men of justice and honor, and ethics. We desire to represent only the most worthy of clients. He rolled his eyes, added slightly. For a minor increase in honorarium, we can be persuaded to, well, shift our allegiance? Saxby shook his head. No soap. You don't scare me. There's no reason for me to deal with you at all. Here's the setup as I get it. Keen and Marshall came to you, asked you to fiddle around and frighten me off. To tell the truth, I don't give a hoot or the kid anymore. But I don't like being pushed around. We're engaged. I've got letters to prove it, and I'm damned if I'm going to release her under pressure. Men can sue for breach of promise, too, you know. The dean assumed a wheedling attitude. Why not forget the girl entirely? Why not sign a paper I've got here in my pocket, rejecting all claims on her? Be a good sport. Don't force us to publicize your uh, eccentricities. Saxby purpled. Eccentricities? So that's the frame-up? I'm as sane as you are. Miss Marcia doesn't say you're completely gone. She feels, however, that it's sneaking up on you. She seems to feel that Professor Eggleston is somehow upsetting you. A healthy young man like you, under the spell of an old crackpot like... I'm not under anyone's spell, and Marcia damn well knows it. Saxby's jaw pivoted from side to side in suppressed rage. Such nonsense. How can she say such things? She associates with the professor as much as I do, and lately more. As a matter of fact, it was at one of the professor's Hello Neighbor parties that she met that fat slob Beanie Keen. Just a second, the dean put in. I don't quite follow you. What's this about Hello Neighbor parties? It's a goofy name, isn't it? Just a kind of idea an academic recluse would dig up. Some weeks ago, a handful of us university court residents received notes from Eggleston. He said that he was getting lonesome in his old age and was ashamed of not knowing any of his neighbors any better. He suggested that we gather at his house once a week for an old-fashioned corn-popping and horse-and-buggy sociability. Well, we felt sorry for the old boy and accepted his invitation. We've been meeting ever since. Had a meeting last night, as a matter of fact. Pretty boring, but it seems to cheer him up. Last night? The dean arched his eyebrows. Then he showed you the book he was binding? He didn't show it to me. I happened to notice it. Funny thing about that book. He says the bugs are getting in his library and that he's rebinding it to protect it. Well, for one thing, he's got at least a thousand volumes. One at a time like that is ridiculous. Secondly, you don't strip the back off a rare book as you would a banana peel to protect it. That's sacrilege and will completely devaluate it. However, if you had a stolen book, say with the name or other identifying marks on the end papers, you might find it advisable to do just that. Rebind it. The dean wasn't listening. He asked casually, About this Hello Neighbor Club, 
It actually fascinates me. By any chance, did the late Miss Taggart belong to your little group? Yes, Saxby nodded. She did. Eggleston organized it just after she had all those unfortunate doings at her home. At the time, we all suspected that he was really thinking of her, that he was attempting to cheer her up through her period of adversity. When she died from too many sleeping powders, we all chipped in and bought her a big wreath. Now we don't much miss her. Nor she you, the dean grinned. Well, Saxby, though I wouldn't want to be quoted, you seem perfectly sane to me. My personal advice is that you release the girl to Bogardus if you really want to get even with her. But you seem to have contrary opinions on the subject. By the way, off the record, you know she can make out a pretty good case of lunacy against you. She claims that you're entertaining delusions, that you're a treasure hunter, that you've been out mapping the surrounding community. That's true. I like charts. They're my hobby. Fooey, sir. Saxby smiled wryly. Take it or leave it. We'll leave it for the time being. Now, Miss Marcia Cowan is most concerned over these prize fighter pictures which embellish your halls and chambers. She declares that she's quizzed you on this point and you respond that you've suddenly taken an interest in old-time bare-knuckle boxing. Now, why did you hang these boxers? There must be a reason. What is it? Saxby looked embarrassed. He said quietly, I'm going to do a strange thing. I'm going to tell the truth. I've got a quirk in my brain. Had it ever since I was a kid. I've got to be a big shot. Put on the dog. I have a small income and I spend it all on front. I picked up this house for a song. It's a rat trap. An orange crate. It looks good on the outside, but in here it's cheap as hell. Floor sag, baseboards don't meet, and so on. I try to cover everything up, but it seems as though every few days something else goes bad on me. I had those old prints up in a trunk. They're mementos of better days. I was forced to get them out and put them to work. Take a look at this. We followed him into the parlor. He swung a picture out on its wire, gave us a glimpse behind it. The plaster had crumbled from the lathes in a patch as large as your hand. Replace the frame. If I have it replastered, I have to have the entire room repapered. And the same out in the hall. And I don't have the kale. It would be torture for me to stare at those tenement house blemishes. The dean asked, How long has it been since these walls got this way? You imply that it happened rather abruptly. He took us to the front door. Abruptly hell. The Saxby mansion has been slowly disintegrating ever since I moved in. To answer your question, I should say those walls went bad on me about a month or so ago. I remember it was while I was attending one of Professor Eggleston's parties. Keen and Miss Cowan walked as far as the gate with me. I asked them in for cake and coffee, but they declined. When I got inside, I was glad they didn't come. I would have died of mortification if they witnessed my actual poverty. The dean said gently, My friends somehow enjoy looking at cracked walls and patched wallpaper. I guess they just don't know any better. Good afternoon, sir. All the way back to town, the chief seemed smugly self-satisfied. I grabbed the old pump handle and got to work on him, but the more I questioned him, the tighter he clamped up. Finally, I said, Boss, I've changed my mind. Eggleston's out and Saxby's in. Yep, Saxby's our baby. You know that patch of bare lathe behind the picture he showed us? Let me tell you something. That plaster didn't fall off. It was chiseled off. Saxby removed it himself. It's a man-made job, all right, the dean agreed. But it brings up a delicate problem, which we'd better not go into just at this moment. He came up to a stop at the curb and said, You go back to the apartment. I'm half expecting our clients to make a return visit. Not in pairs this time, but in singles. I have a feeling that they were uh, inhibited this afternoon by each other's presence. Take them as they come. Find out what they have to add to their original story and give him the bums rush. I'd rather they not meet, he paused, and keep an eye peeled. It might interest you to learn that we're in deadly peril. I'll be along shortly, just a little stroll to settle my nerves, and I'll join you. Nerves? He had no more nerves than that wax arm in Captain Kunkel's straw suitcase. Always, when a case really got rolling and the pressure began to gather, he'd amble off and leave me hanging on to the safety valve. He had friends in all walks of life. Folks I'd never seen. Bartenders. Elevator operators. Newsboys. 
when he needed some particular tidbit of information, he'd flush me off and do his circuit alone. He usually came back with a dope, too. I never asked him where he'd been. Confidential information was just that to the dean, and wild horses couldn't force him to betray a friend. All at once I had an idea. I put on an act. I'm just a bomb boy, I griped, just a peon. Go back to the apartment, he says lawfully, and I needs must fly. I'm nothing but a robot, and he's the master carrying my brain around in his watch case. I groveled, asking Sir Viley. And which route must I select on my return, sire? Shall I go by Cherry Street, or shall I go by Fourth? He said frostily, quit clowning. Go any way you like. This is no time for amateur theatricals. This is murder. So I returned home via Dorgan's Alley. Of course, it was ten blocks or so out of the way, but Sam the switchman kept shop in Dorgan's Alley. The neighborhood was bleak and grim, squalid with run-down eateries and cutthroat hawk shops, tenderloin and low-grade tenderloin at that. The setting sun struck through the cloud splits in the sodden sky, painted the shabby storefronts in lavender and rose in the exact iridescent tint of putrefying meat. The sidewalks were deserted. Here the denizens didn't leave their holes until nightfall. I only hope I came out of this all right. The dean had one strict rule. No freelancing on my part. And I knew he really melt my ears down if I bungled it. I turned at a dingy second-hand clothing emporium and it entered the brick-paved channel mouth of the alley. I'd peddled papers as a kid, and since then, in one way or another, I'd knocked about our fair city until I knew it pretty well. This was one section I kept away from. Dorgan's Alley was plenty mean, just a half block long and dead end. It was a warren of filthy flats, deadfalls, and hideouts. A sullen double row of blank blistered doors set in the windowless brick facing. I picked my way through the littered trash, the foul ash cans and the stinking refuse, and began counting doors. The switchman's, I'd heard, was on the ground floor of number seven, down toward the end of the line. The guy's real name was Sam Franzel, and he was one of the town's leading fences. The stories I'd gotten it was that he was strictly upper bracket, that if there was any big stuff floating around, you could bet that the switchman had taken a peep at it. He was reputed to be as cagey as a vixen, and dangerous. I twisted the Nick China doorknob, stepped into a dank hall lit by a feeble fly speck bulb. If Mr. Saxby was allergic to cracked plaster and stained wallpaper, he should have seen this place. I walked the length of the vile quarter, knocked at the door at the end of the hall. A cheery, melodic voice sung out an invitation to enter. The switchman's office was rigged up like a flophouse bedroom. The warped floorboards were bare of rugs. There was an iron pipe bed, a dresser with peeled veneer, a kitchen table, and a safe. Like I said, safes used to be my profession. This box stood in the corner and was of the vintage of the Spanish-American War. Beside the safe was a closet door. Franzel was seated at the table. He was a sloppy-looking, fat man, unshaven with a wet, pendulous underlip and smoky green eyes. His fawn shirt was wrinkled and dirty, and he was dressed in a shoddy gray suit, like a respectable tradesman and hard luck. He had a deck of cards in his hand and was dealing out a little canfield. There was a score pad by his elbow. He dropped the cards on the tabletop, wheeled around on his chair seat, and asked, You the rent collector? His rich baritone was jovial, ingratiating. I laughed. Hardly. I got hot news for you. My brother-in-law sent me. Who, the switchman asked blandly, is this brother-in-law? An old reliable customer of yours, Mr. Franzel, a guy that's got your best interest at heart. We'll let it stand at that. He's been here to see you many a time. Franzel waited, deadpan. For no reason at all, I kept worrying about that old-time safe. A big dealer like the switchman would have had a better box than that. I glanced about the walls. They were bare, no telltale pictures. Then I doped it. He had a floor safe. He had a floor safe in the closet. I'd installed many a similar jobs myself in the past. I said, this is for free, just to be sure we're being honest with each other, Mr. Franzel. A college professor named Eggleston is all set to make up a batch of phony emeralds. Does that make sense to you? Did it? He batted his eyes like a frog snapping at a horsefly. No friend, it makes no sense whatever. I never heard of anyone named Eggleston, and I'm not interested in emeralds, genuine or fake. 
However, as a token of mutual trust, I give you Dr. Mary and Dr. John. How are we doing? I frown. Not so good. I don't get it. The switchman fingered his juicy hanging lip in reverie. Let's go back to the beginning. I'd dearly love to hear a bit more about this brother-in-law. Just who did you say he was? Sorry, no can do. He's just a gink that trades with you. Once you did him a favor, now he wants to even things up. I lowered my voice, spoke urgently. The cops are wise. They know you've been tampering with the Simpson collection. They don't know how you did it, but they know you've managed somehow to get to it. If you've still got the stuff in your possession, you'd better put it back where it came from, and quick. The law's about ready to crack down. Franzel shook his flabby jowls sorrowfully. I swear on my dear mother's grave that I've never heard of the Simpson collection. Frankly, I consider it a figment of your enterprising imagination. I believe I finally make you. You almost fooled me for a moment. You're just another live wire sharpshooter trying to move in on me. It's an old story to me, son. And as usual, I've got a good answer. I'm going to hate to do this. But a man in my position, you know, I've got a reputation to keep up. While he was rambling on, I happened to take a gander at the pad on the table by the deck of cards. He hadn't been totaling his Canfield wins. It was a Pinoche score for two players. One column was headed me. That was Franzel, and the other said Virgil. I'd busted into a sociable little game, and where was Virgil? I thought I knew, and I didn't enjoy the thought. Virgil was behind me, in the clothes closet, no doubt, holding a bead between my shoulder blades. I decided to scram. I said carelessly, You got me wrong, Mr. Franzel. I'm trying to be a pal. If you feel that way about it, I'll be going. So long, I've said my piece. You don't seem to relish my presence. But I do, the fat man smiled nastily. I do relish your presence. In fact, I'm going to request that you remain. He raised his voice, called softly. Oh, Virgil! I seem to be needing you. There was a sound of footsteps behind me. I half turned my head, got a glimpse of the open closet filled with coat hangers and dirty linen, saw Virgil ambling toward me. I know a gunman when I see one. This specimen was crying for trouble. He was a smart aleck type, and that's the worst, resplendent in flashy tweeds and with a fancy marshalled hairdo that had everything but ribbons and perfume. He held the big caliber automatic in his bony effeminate hand. He ignored me, asked, What's on your mind, Mr. Franzel? Take him out to the quarry. Just like that. No arguments, no long sermons. I began to sweat, I said calmly. Okay, let's go, Virgil. <clears throat> I want to talk to you. The dapper gunman smirked. What you want to tell me? I want to talk to you about my brother-in-law. He's got quite a noodle on his shoulders. Ben, he says to me. The switchman's a funny one. Take a big shop fence like Franzel. Imagine all the dough he has to keep on hand. Yet, he's only got a tin can safe that you could open with a tackle hammer. It isn't logical, he says. Virgil was entranced. He nudged me with his gun muzzle. I ain't interested. Let's get going. His tone was nervous, excited. I went on. My brother-in-law is a good friend of Mr. Franzel's, but he's quite a curious fellow. Every time he's been here, he sort of cases the place. The safe there in the corner, he thinks is a blind. The money's hidden somewhere else. Where? Well, my brother-in-law favors the clothes closet. He says, Virgil cut me off. On your way, bud. Let's get going. He spoke in a monotone, but he couldn't conceal a note of eagerness. Franzel made up his mind. His big mobile face had been twisting itself in indecision. Put the gun away, Virgil, he ordered. We'll give him another chance. I just wanted to show him, I mean business. He addressed me. You, get the hell out of here. Keep out of my affairs and tell that brother-in-law of yours to button up his big mouth before he catches himself some misery. The switchman's roly-poly face wasn't so merry now. His smoky green eyes bore into mine in cloudy hate. I said, Methinks I will now promenade. Good day, all. When I hit the street, my armpits were ringing wet. It was a mighty close call in anybody's book. And I knew it. Part 4. Highbrow Pocket Pool Dusk had fallen by the time I returned to our apartment. From the light in the reception room window, I saw we had a guest. Jay Bogardus Keene, the retired self-styled tycoon, 
this time alone was giving the poor folks an encore of his exalted personality. Obnoxious in his houndstooth plod, he was posed on the love seat as though it were a throne, elegant, wrist poised on meaty thigh, his big red chin ensconced impressively in the cupped palm of his other hand, not telling how long he'd been holding the position. He looked as if some surf had swept his crown and scepter and someone was going to get scolded. His head reared back as I entered, his tiny porcelain eyeballs popped open in their little sacks of withered skin, he said angrily. You've kept me waiting 24 minutes and 31 seconds. I used one of the dean's favorite tricks. When clients get high horse with him, he puts them in the old mortar and ground them down to a fine powder. I said absently, oh, hi there, whatchamacallit. Come back tomorrow. This is our busy day. That rocked him. He changed his manner to a wheedle, said, I'm Mr. Keene, remember? I paid you a $50 retainer this noon. You're working for me, don't you recall? Miss Cowan and I, the lady, I remember. You, I forget. What's on your mind? Ah, uh, yes, sweet Marcia. He tried unsuccessfully to appear boyishly, bashful. What a lucky chap I am to be favored by her tender affection, which happens to bring me to the point of my visit. On our earlier call, under the stress of emotion, Miss Cowan got her story a bit jangled. Now, if you're going to help us, and her in particular, I felt that I'd better drop by and straighten things out, just for the record, you see. Make it snappy. This is after closing hours. I'm getting ready to lock up. Closing hours, I thought. What a blissful pipe dream. He could talk fast and sensibly when he had to. It's this. I believe Miss Cowan stated that these little visits she's been paying to Eggleston's you know, the button sewing and patching and so forth, were our idea, hers and mine. It's an act of sacrificing charity on her part, and I only wish I could share in the glory. However, the actual facts are a bit different. I have the definite impression that these calls were started at the professor's instigation, not Miss Cowan's. Maybe a phone call, maybe a note. The professor's a great note writer. What about the old man's puppy love? That part's true enough. He begins throwing calf eyes every time she heaves into sight. Another thing, he has his own goofy pet name for her. She says whenever they're alone, he always calls her Dr. Mary. It's so strange, it scares her. He just oogles her and it's Dr. Mary and this and Dr. Mary that. No kidding. Does he by any chance refer to you as Dr. John? Keen looked irritated. Never. I'm a man, sir. Men don't call each other by pet names. I'll be extremely relieved when you people get this all cleared up. I didn't say so this noon, but I feel sinister forces at work. There's much more here than shows on the surface. I'm getting the gradual impression that the goings-on out at University Court, the Hello Neighbor Club and all that, are somehow linked with that Taggart tragedy. I feel that perhaps there's more to come. And what, I asked sternly, in the Dean's best manner, and what brings you to that morbid conclusion? There's a man in our neighborhood who has been spying on us all. This man has been sneaking around, prying. He's been in my backyard and in Marshall's, and no doubt Professor Eggleston has seen him prowling about on his premises too. When he's confronted and questioned as to his disgusting behavior, he laughs brazenly and spouts nonsense about searching for treasure. Please don't ask me to name him. He's an old beau of Marshall's, and I feel it would be more proper to keep him anonymous. You mean Saxby, I yawned. You told me all about him before. Gracious, did I? Did his name slip through my lips? Keen got to his feet. I'll be getting along. Um, I never hired detectives before. What's the customary time? I mean, how long before I can expect results? I ushered him to the door, said as he departed. An inferior agency can usually crack a simple case like this in about three months. We're twice as good as most agencies, so we should be able to do it in twice the time. Give us six months, and I guarantee. He stamped down the hall, puffing and snorting. It was the dean's habit, when a tough case really began to barrel, to forego all thought of food. The Lord only knows how many meals I've skipped since I've been with him. Bearing this in mind, I took advantage of the lull which followed the exit of Jay Bogardus. I retired to the kitchen, tossed up a stack of sandwiches, and brewed a pot of coffee. I just placed the grub on the table when the chief came in through the back door. Without a word of greeting, he pulled up a chair, sat down, and cleaned the platter before I realized what was happening. By sheer luck, I salvaged the child's portion for myself. 
I rustled him for the coffee pot, said angrily, Hey! I need sustenance, Benton, he explained amiably. I've been out on the campus, poking around in cellars and so on. I've found it. It was back in a sort of sub-basement under the old abandoned library building. Gad, it was a sight to behold. I phoned Malloy, disguised my voice, and reported it. Has Bogardus Keen been in? I nodded. The girl? Uh-uh, not yet. He yanked out his huge antique silver watch. We'll give her a quarter of an hour, and then we must be off. Things are crystallizing. It's about all over now. It's a peculiar affair. I know who, but I don't know why. As I was trying to suck me in, but I couldn't help it, I asked. What did you find in the basement of the Codge Library? Another corpse? You need a bromide, he declared solicitously. You're developing acute necrophilia. He heard the clickety-clack of spike kills in the quarter. There's Miss Marcia Cowan. She sounds like she's loaded for bear. We reached the reception room just as she came steaming through the door. That fake attitude of helpless feminine humility had completely disappeared. Her boyish little figure was tense. She asked curtly, Has Mr. Keene been here? Beanie. The dean nodded his brow. I haven't seen him. If he came, I was out. Why? She looked relieved. I'm glad I got here first. If you should see him and he has anything to say, don't believe it. I swear, I have the worst luck with my men. Steve Saxby goes lunatic on me and I shift to Beanie. Beanie welcomes me with open arms, so to speak, and at first we get along okay. The last few days it's been different. I've had the queer sensation that he's using me somehow, that I'm kind of a tool. Golly, I think I'll go Hogwald and marry old Eggleston. The dean appeared mildly amused. You feel Mr. Keene is using you? In what way? It's hard to explain. Take Steve Saxby. Beanie rants and raves over him and asks me dozens of questions about him. At first, I put it down to jealousy, but he's so persistent that sometimes I get the idea he's not really envious at all, that he's just pretending, using that as an excuse to quiz me about my ex ex fiance. I even get the impression that he doesn't care for me at all and that his only interest in me is my previous relationship with Steve. Now Professor Eggleston comes in for abuse. It's the same thing all over again, like with Steve. What did the professor say to me? How did he act? Did he give me any presents? Her delicate jaw went hard. I'm not particularly adept in the field of domestic relations, the dean said timidly, but I can't help wondering why, if Beanie's so nauseating, you don't boot him out of your pretty little life. And go back to Steve Saxby? Hardly. She looked suddenly frightened. Steve's essentially a dangerous man. He's vindictive and he holds a grudge. Like I keep telling you, he's stark raving mad. What do you think of this? She opened her pocketbook, handed the chief a sheet of notepaper. He laid it on the table, studied it. I joined him. It was a diagram made in heavy pencil. There was a longish rectangle, and on the inside of the rectangle, diagonal lines cut crisscross from one side to another. At the corners of the rectangle and halfway down each side were small circles. Down at the bottom of the paper was written, Mercator's projection, 19 feet above sea level, scale one quarter inch to one foot, S. Saxby, cartographer. What in the heck is it, I asked. The dean was befuddled. Believe it or not, it's a map of a pool table. This heavy rectangle is the table. These little circles are the pockets. These lines must represent banks or caromes. I can't seem to figure it. This Mercator's projection, sleeve level, and so forth is all malarkey, of course, to confuse the issue. Suddenly he grinned. Gad, I've got it. Think of that, he turned to the girl. How did this come into your hands? One night, some weeks ago, while I was still going with Steve, I dropped in to visit him. He had a cold and was back in the study amusing himself by working on this. When I left, I hooked it. I don't know why, except I guess even then I realized his mind was buckling. Does Steve have a pool table? She shook her head. Do you? Heavens no. She considered. Beanie Keen has one up in his attic. It's past the state of being usable. The cushions are no good. The felt is all torn. Why? The dean was brusque. I must ask you to leave now. Here are my final instructions. Be at Steve Saxby's tonight at nine and bring Mr. J. Bogart as keen. She faltered. Beanie won't come. He loathes. I don't mean for you to put a halter on him and drive him there. Just phone him that you're spending the evening with your ex-fiancé. He'll come galloping up, 
tossing his mane, flinging his fetlocks, and don't tell anyone you've been here. After she had gone, I began to gripe. Now it's a map of a pool table. Before it was wax arm, imitation emeralds, and the mystery of a third andiron. He looked disgusted. Are you still harping on that third andiron? And irons come in sets of two. It's never been the mystery of the third. It's actually the mystery of the fourth. Where is the extra one? I was just about to tell him about Keen's visit and my adventure with Sam the Switchman when Lieutenant Bill Malloy walked in on us. Malloy had an ominous cat in the canary gleam in his eye, as though he finally had the dean just where he wanted him. He said softly, I'm glad I caught you in rock. Remember that Manzoli arm the skipper had? The one that was found on the doorstep of the lunch wagon out at University Court? Well, there have been developments along that line. Would you be interested? The dean nodded eagerly. Indeed I would. What? After we left you this noon, the skipper checked on your story. He found out that the arm was really a museum piece, like you said, and that it came from the collection of a man upstate, a rich hombre, recently deceased, named Simpson. The Simpson, it appears, left his art treasures to the local college. We got in touch with the university museum, and they informed us that the stuff was no doubt in transit, was expected daily. Gad, think of that. Yep. Well, tonight comes the payoff. The janitor of the college phones us that he's discovered some big boxes in the basement of the library building. We go out and find the Simpson collection. The crates have been ripped open, the stuff laying around on the floor. We haven't been able to learn as yet if anything's missing, other than the arm, of course. How does it sound? Very intriguing, I must admit. The dean seemed entranced. You haven't heard it all at that, Malloy grinned. The college janitor told us he hadn't phoned. Maybe, the dean suggested suavely. It was the assistant janitor, lieutenant. Maybe it was. I'd like to have a talk with him. He used such fancy language, all loaded with expressions like Jove and Gad. Jove, sir, the dean exclaimed. I can hardly believe it. Rock, Malloy said quietly. How did you find that cash? The express company says it was delivered last week and signed for by a Dr. Douglas. There's no Douglas on the faculty. What does it all mean? It's the sequel to those deaths two months ago. Out at Miss Taggart's. It means murder. Malloy flinched. The Taggart case again? I'd hope that mess was settled with the old lady's suicide. The teen scoffed. Suicide? Fooey! You're just taking the easiest solution. Listen, according to you, either the two victims committed suicide or they were slain by their hostess. Who in that case committed... Oh, baloney. It was murdered three times. Miss Taggart was a victim, not a killer. And the slayer still at large? Malloy was hesitant. I can't say that I agree. The old woman must have done it. Here's why. Recall the old lady took her cat Ophelia out for a stroll every evening about 11? The conclusion was that the shots let loose while she was gone. Perhaps, but we asked a few questions around the neighborhood. This so-called walk Miss Taggart always took wasn't a real walk at all just to turn up to the corner and back. Grant that the pistol went off while she was out of hearing. Even then, she must have returned right in the heels of the detonations. According to you, the killer must have been in the house at that moment, and he must have stayed. Remember, he rifled the bodies and burned wallets and such? That takes time. Could be, Lieutenant. Unlikely. Here's the reason. The old lady always locked all the doors from the inside with turned keys. The keys were untouched the next morning. The windows have old-fashioned clamps that holds them half open. No chance of a prowler escaping there. And furthermore, the old lady was a slight sleeper. Her room was on the ground floor at the foot of the stairs. She was hopped up over having strangers with her and swore she didn't sleep a wink, said that the upstairs hall and the staircase squeak at the slightest provocation. She heard absolutely nothing. Maybe, the dean said, leering horribly. Maybe he's still there, living in the cabinet under the kitchen sink, a loathsome creature, ragged, bearded, creeping out at night, stalking through the old mansion to stretch his legs, half man, half ape, living on rats and moths and bats. Malloy looked shocked. That's no way to talk. He picked up his hat and rose. The dean said, Don't go away, Mad. Actually, Lieutenant, it's about finished. Meet me tonight at nine at Steve Saxby's out in University Court. Bring Professor Eggleston. We shall see what we shall see. Part 5. Dr. Mary and Dr. John 
The instant Malloy left us and we were alone again, I got it off my chest. I gave the boss a detailed report of my experiences in the interim while we had been separated. I started off with Keen, and then, because I couldn't see any way out of it, I made a clean breast of the matter and related my adventures at the Switchman's. I expected him to fly off the handle in a tantrum of violent sarcasm. He was mighty temperamental about me freelancing. But to my astonishment, he patted me on the back as if I were a water spaniel and said, Good boy, good boy. All at once, his eyes went blank. He looked as though he'd been socked on the skull with a maul. He said, Do my ears deceive me? Did you say Dr. Mary and Dr. John? Did Malloy say Douglas? He rubbed his jaw in trance-like concentration. It's the master key, Ben, he exclaimed jubilantly. Just a minute, please, while I make sure. He hurried into the office, came back with a thick paper-bound volume. I got an upside-down look at the title while he thumbed the pages. Catalog historical gems, private collections, foundation, etc., 1933 to 1943. He found his place, read eagerly. Doctors Mary and John Douglas, private traveling collection, lectures by owners, exhibits preferably academic, can be arranged by contacting owners, Two Stag Ranch, RFD2, Meadville, Colorado. He closed the book, laid it on the mantelpiece. That does it. Now we know the motive. That explained Professor Eggleston and his formula for imitation emeralds. And Steve Sachse's prize fighters. Let's go. Darkness has settled down over the desolate landscape by the time we paid our second visit to University Court. The neighborhood had been dreary in daylight. It was downright sepulchral in the shifting moon glow. We passed by Saxby's and the side street where Keene and Miss Cowan lived. I figured we were heading for old Eggleston's, but we passed the professor's white brick cottage too. A block beyond Eggleston's, we turned left, and after three more squares, left once more. Abruptly, the chief stopped. Taggart House, he said quietly. Keep your wits about you. Anything can happen from here on in. All afternoon we'd been skirting around it. Finally we'd come to case it. Two months had elapsed since the death. I couldn't believe it might hold any importance at this late date. I didn't like its look. A cumbersome old frame mansion is set back in a weedy lawn, waiting for the gentle hand of time to shove in its sagging roof. It must have been a knockout in its day, but now its gingerbread scroll work had rotted from the cornices. Its clapboard were warped and cupped from the siding. I followed the boss across the unkempt yard to the rear. We stood a moment in the shadow of a grape arbor while he scrutinized the back of the building. He did it leisurely, studying the dilapidated facing from eaves to foundation. Directly opposite us was a one-story summer kitchen built flush to the side. The kitchen roof sloped up 12 feet or so to a row of three second-story windows. Three black windows like three missing teeth. I said, we don't need to go in, do we? We can solve it by just peeping, can't we? Maybe we should have brought camp stools? The dean was unruffled. Peeping, like everything else, has its place, my boy. He stepped into the moonlight and approached the summer kitchen. I tailed along. The summer kitchen had no basement, and there was a kind of lattice grill between the floor joists and the ground. The dean reached down, removed a section of his last work. He bent forward, threw the beam of his flashlight under the porch. Hmm, he said, this is more like it. I stooped over and took a look. There on the ancient spongy earth lay the fourth and iron, an owl and iron, and beside it was a neat coil of hair-thin wire. Well, well, I murmured. Now we got it. What do we do with it? The dean straightened up. We leave it where it is. Let's get inside. I want to see the murder room. The lock on the back door was in an old-time mortise job. I opened it with a dime store skeleton key. Old houses have a queer, stale human smell. We went through a high ceiling kitchen into the front hall. There, as Malloy had said, next to the parlor and at the foot of the stairs was Miss Taggart's bedroom. We ascended to the second floor. The murder room was at the end of the corridor and hadn't been touched since the slayings. It was a melancholy tomb. 1890 flowered wallpaper, a red rag, dusty knickknacks, and faded crayon portraits. The three andirons were still in the fireplace, and so was the patch of window screen. The bloody bedclothes were gone, of course, and a mattress had been turned over to hide the blemish. The dean made straight for the window. I heard him chuckle. Observe, he whispered. Observe and ponder. A small awning hook had been screwed in the center of the trim above the window. 
Smugly, he showed me the hole in the top of the upper sash. It was a tiny auger hole, and if he hadn't pointed it out, I would have missed it. From a legal point of view, he declared, this is a momentous discovery. It proves that the murder was done by an outsider who was a consequence still at large. How? how? Miss Taggart came home and went to bed while the slayer was still in the house. The slayer anticipated this and had made plans for it. The shots were fired while she was away. The escape was made after she had retired. Now, observe this window. It presents quite a problem for an escapee. It's old-fashioned and has no sash weights. Little spring clamps in the sides of the sash can be adjusted to hold the window half open, not clear open. And half open isn't enough to permit the convenient exit of a fugitive. How did he do it? It had me stumped. Quite simply, he used the andiron as a counterweight. He opened the window, fed his wire over the awning hook and through the auger hole, tied the andiron on it and lowered it to the ground. He doubled the wire so that later, when he was out, he could reeve it back to him. The loop end he slipped on the finger left at the bottom of the sash. The lower sash was thus held open for him. The screen, I might add, was pure genius. He was confronted with a screen, so he cut it out of its frame, laid it across the andirons in the fireplace and pretended to use it as a grate. Once outside, after he climbed down the kitchen roof to the ground, he pulled his wire back to him. The window lowered itself and the spring clamps caught it and held it half open. He smiled happily. Wait till Bill Malloy hears of this. We descended to the ground floor. We'd started again for the kitchen when we noticed the portiers. Heavy mildewed velvet curtains on a pole and rings about a third of the way down the hall. Curiously, the dean thrust forward an index finger like a rapier, parted them and swung his flash beam into the opening. Jove, he exclaimed, this is a treat. I didn't imagine any of these things he'd survived. He stepped inside. I strolled in after him. We were in a small, musty room, and such a room I'd never conjured up, even in my wildest dreams. There was a Hindu punka on the ceiling, a big oriental divan in the corner, piled with silken pillows. The walls were draped in rotting purple brocade, and everywhere were incense burners and hookahs and Asiatic brass lamps. I couldn't grasp it, I asked. What is this? An opium layout? Did the old lady hit the pipe? Nothing of the kind, the dean retorted crossly. This is a Turkish corner. They were very much the vogue in Fadish homes about the turn of the century. To us now it seems foolish and silly, but the maidens of yesterday considered them very exotic and romantic. Miss Taggart's Turkish corner, however, is getting a little on the putrid side. I said, it's very adorable and all that, but who does that foot belong to? That foot sticking out from those comfy pillows on the divan. We shoved the cushions inside and uncovered the portly body of J. Bogardus Keene, deader than a nickel's worth of stew meat. His forehead had been bashed in, and I'm here to tell you, he made a mighty repulsive corpse. He lay there spread-eagled, his tiny bird eyes glazed, his sporty check suit bagged and lumpy about his elbows and knees. I said moodily, he knew this was coming. He just the same as told me so. The dean showed no sympathy. He brought it on himself. When you go messing around in murder, you can expect disaster to... Ain't that the truth? A cruel husky voice spoke up from behind us. Turn around and slow. The switchman and his dapper bodyguard Virgil, and they weren't fooling. They were a couple of earnest tradesmen working on a project, and they were all set to do a professional job. They carried big bore guns close to their hips in the best hoodlum style. Franzel brought his huge body to an easy stop, asked, Why'd you knock off the stiff on the couch there? The elegant Virgil, his hat back on his head so you could see his beautiful Marcel, echoed his boss. Yeah, why? The dean said archly, I'm a detective. If you wish to ask me questions, I must ask you to deposit a retaining fee with Mr. Matthews, my assistant. If you're just a couple of gawking sightseers, fan out of here. We're busy. In his own mind, the switchman concerned himself a big shot. It was like slapping him in the face. He flushed. The dean turned to Virgil, the dapper underling, and said... Evan Lee, you are here for a purpose. As you, sir, are the best dressed, I presume you are the head man, and this ragamuffin is your servant. What brings you to this house? Virgil looked pleased and flattered. He patted his fancy hairdo and said, I ain't exactly head man. We're sort of partners, you see. Franzel cut him off viciously. I'm the number one man in this little party, my friend, and I'll ask the questions. He lashed out verbally at the dean. Where's the rest of the Douglas collection? 
Oh, oh, the dean exclaimed. I place you now. You're Franzel, the fence. God, you're a filthy-looking specimen, I must say. I know all about you. I've been anxious to meet you. The switchman's jowls quivered in insensate rage. You know all about me? I do, indeed. Two months ago, a man and a woman came to this old house and asked Miss Taggart, the owner, for a night's lodgings. These people were Dr. Mary and Dr. John Douglas. I, like yourself, am interested in gems, but from a slightly more honest angle. I've known about the Douglases for years. They possess the most valuable collection of historical jewels. They took this collection on tours in person and gave lectures to academic groups. How they happen to be here in town is another story. Francel sneered. The dean continued. About seven o'clock on the night of their arrival, they were murdered in their beds. The slayer stole the gems and escaped through the window. Are you saying that I murdered these? No, not actually. But later you became involved. The killer, an amateur, wasn't certain just how to market his plunder. He'd selected a few less valuable items and contacted you. You beat him down so mercilessly on his blood money that he decided to hold back the rest until a better market came along. You warmed out of him where he had acquired them. But you didn't suspect that the batch you bought wasn't a sum total. Didn't suspect it, that is, until Mr. Matthews here visited you this afternoon and set you back on the trail. You came here thinking the Slayer might have secreted them here in some hiding place? Frenzel said, nuts. If these Douglases were so important, why aren't they missed? They are missed. Out in Meadville, Colorado at Two Stag Ranch. Their visit to town was obviously a side trip and went unreported. He paused, added, any way you twist it, you see it's murder and you're an accessory after the fact. Now I guess we'd all be better be getting down to police headquarters. That did it. He was deliberately goading them. Virgil was nervous, undecided. Franzal was trembling, loose-lipped in fury. The big man broke first. He swung his gun muzzle, and I went for the bulldog in my belt. It was like living in two worlds, a world of sound and a world of movement. The dean's hand bent suddenly at the wrist, and his big blue magnum came out from its shoulder clip, firing as a gun sight cleared leather. Virgil got in two rounds, and then the deep-throated three fifty seven of the chief smacked my eardrums three times, hand running. Franzal's enormous body buckled and collapsed. A little purple blossom appeared on Virgil's cheek. He splayed his fingers, dropped to the floor as if he'd been blackjacked. One second the racket was stunning, the next the room was dead still. The dean said, Ben? Yes, chief. Pointed to my short gun, limp in my grasp, half out of my belt. Touch that thing off. Fire a charge in the ceiling, son. In the ceiling? Why? It's repressed. Relax it. It got to the party late, all dressed up and no place to go. I tried to take it, but it was wormwood and gall to me. Sometimes I get to thinking I'm a little better than I am with a handgun and when I fall down, he always rubs a pinch of salt into my wounded vanity. He does it for my own good and I know it, but it's mighty hard to swallow, I said. Let's get out of here. Saxby met us at his front door as if we were a couple of typhoid carriers. His anemic hatchet face twisted itself into an expression of extreme distaste. We edged by him into the hall, sauntered into the living room. Bill Malloy and the professor had not yet arrived. Marcia Cowan was perched daintily on the edge of the sofa, her handkerchief balled in her lap, her pretty eyes red-rimmed. It was obvious that our genial host had been working on her, trying to talk her into returning to him. A strange picture it was, the barn-like room with its cheap rugs and borax furniture, the domineering pigeon-chested little man, and the weeping gal. I sat down on a pseudo Duncan five chair, hooked my hat on my knee. No one said anything. The dean remained standing. He kept yanking out his watch, studying it. That didn't settle our nerves any. When the doorbell cut loose, we all jumped. Saxby left the group, returned with the lieutenant and old man Eggleston. Malloy was poker face lowering. His dwarfish, bespeckled companion gazed about in dreamy confusion. The dean said heartily, Welcome, Professor. You're just in time. I'm about to explain the bizarre enigma of the arm of Mother Manzoli. He addressed Miss Cowan. Did you contact Mr. Keene? I phoned, the kid said, but I couldn't get an answer. Well, we won't wait. We might as well begin. It won't take long. The dean began to lecture. Two months ago, a Dr. Marion, Dr. John Douglas, possessors of a valuable gem collection, stopped in at the home of your neighbor, Miss Taggart, to spend the night. They were murdered in their beds. The killer escaped with the jewels. 
Later, as a safeguard, he killed the old lady too. Somehow their identity got out to a closed group here in university court. Maybe Miss Taggart remembered things about her guest and relayed them to her neighbors. Anyway, a pack of jackals got on the trail of the stones. Everyone spying on everyone else. Saxby listened gravely. Professor Eggleston said, Tisk tisk. It was you, Professor, the dean continued, who had the cleverest scheme. And if I hadn't come in when I did, doubtless, it would have worked. It was this elaborate stratagem of yours, by the way, that revealed the whole unholy mess to me. We'll never know what your intentions were. I'm inclined to give you the benefit of the doubt and say that you were working for law and order in your own devious way. You knew that the gems had been stolen, for it was you, I imagine, who invited the Douglases to town and sent them to Miss Taggart's for lodging. After the theft, you set about after the recovery of the stones and the exposure of the criminal. Eggleston looked bewildered. Don't deny it, the dean said. First you informed your hello neighbor club to get everyone together. You invited the girl into your home as a helpmeet to pump her. This was all preliminary to your big plan. You knew the Simpson collection, a collection of some fame, was due to arrive in your custody. You put out the word to your friends. You carefully implanted in their minds the impression that you were about to loot it. Take the rebound book, for instance. Even Saxby thought it was illegally acquired. Malloy frowned. The girl started to speak. Stop. The dean went on. The Simpson collection arrived. You tore open the crates, took out the arm of Mother Manzoli, left it at the lunch wagon steps for police to find and investigate. You wanted publicity. What? The time was ripe. You would announce a big imitation emerald and flash it surreptitiously to your Hello Neighbors Club. That was the bait to bring the killer again to action. The thief's natural deduction would be that you had pilfered a priceless stone from the Simpson collection. Professor Eggleston gave us all a toothy smile. So, I'm a murderer? Of course not. You're evidently misunderstanding me. You're not even guilty of petty larceny. That wax arm is back where it belongs. The book you were rebinding is one of your own. He turned to Lieutenant Malloy. Saxby's your man, Lieutenant. Watch him. He's a four-time killer. Saxby smirked. Don't be silly. Where's your proof? You prowl the neighborhood, pretending to make treasure hunting maps, spying on your friends. Keen suspected you, so finally you were forced to eliminate him. Proof, Molloy insisted. You're not offered one single grain of evidence. The dean herded them all into the den at the rear. Wait here. He disappeared toward the front of the house, was gone a moment, showed himself again in the living room. Keep your eyes on me, he called. He walked to the picture on the wall, the picture of Dutch Sam, the prize fighter. Definitely he lifted the print from the frame. Behind the mat was a mirror. We stared at him as he worked. Abruptly, a startling thing happened. No sooner I revealed the mirror than three other mirrors sprang up in its reflection. We found ourselves looking around three walls through two rooms into the front hall at the staircase. There were no glasses over Mr. Saxby's boxing prints, the dean remarked. There couldn't be because they had to be removable. He had it arranged that he could sit back there in the study and watch. It was a problem in angles of reflection and incidence, the same proposition afforded by a pool table. As a matter of fact, he used a diagram of a pool table to help him calculate. Saxby said viciously, So what? I can sit back here and watch my front door. Does that make me a killer? and a robber? They've been so many murders going on, I'm scared of my life. But you're not watching the front door, the dean corrected. You're watching. The stairs, Malloy shook his head. It's suspicious, all right, Rock, but it's no case. The dean began to gripe. Won't anyone let me talk? I've got an important thing to say. He's not watching the stairs or the front door either. He's watching the Newell Post. He's got the loot hidden in the hollow of the newel post. Saxby scrambled to his feet. Quick as a flash, Malloy had the cuffs on him. The dean picked up his hat. Good night, Miss Collin. May the fates be more solicitous of your love life in the future. And good night to you, gentlemen. I will now go home, bite my fingernails, and wait for the insurance company to mail me its customary percentage reward.